Shukriya and Assalamu Alaikum. I, Dr. Aisha Javed, welcome you all to yet another lecture for today at the second annual conference of Pakistan Society of Internal Medicine. I would like to welcome our honorable panel of the chairpersons today for this session. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the honor of having Professor Dr. Sajid Ubedullah with us today and also Professor Dr. Rafi M. Ghori. Professor Dr. Sajid Ubedullah, a highly skilled clinician with over 28 years of experience, an excellent teacher and mentor to many. It's an honor to have you here with us, sir. Sir was one of my teachers at my uh, medical school as well. So it's a pleasure to have you here with us. Please come forward. Bushra could not join us today, and we also have Professor Dr. Rafi Ahmadori, a name that needs no introduction. A clinician with extensive experience in teaching and as well as research. Please welcome, sir. Uh, we have shortened the time of the presentation to around 20 minutes, so I will not take a lot of time. Um, the speaker for today's session that we're going to start right now is a um, so, um, in the interest of time, I'll get started. A little bit about me. A little bit about me. Uh, this is the University of Florida Health, where I am in the Gastroenterology Fellowship. Um, and my fun fact, if you guys are interested, uh, if you have heard uh, of the sports drink Gatorade, uh, the reason it's called Gatorade is because our team mascot at UF uh, is the Gators. We call ourselves the Gators. And Gatorade was actually uh, invented by our Department of Nephrology. Uh, that's Dr. Uh, Wade you see up there in the top. It was invented by our Department of Nephrology for our football team to improve their performance and eventually acquired by uh, Pepsi. So every, that's the whole reason it's called Gatorade. So in the interest of time, I'll proceed with my presentation. I want to discuss the changing prevalence of IBD in newly industrialized countries, reviewing uh, the diagnostic approach for patients with IBD, and I'm going to discuss the current treatment options for IBD, and let's discuss the importance of follow-up and health maintenance of patients with IBD. Um, just one brief slide about basic disease facts, because I want to save my time for other things. Inflammatory bowel disease is a chronic inflammatory. Chronic is the important word. Autoimmune disease. Uh, we all know about this, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Crohn's disease is transmural, has skip lesions, can occur in any part of the GI tract. Whereas ulcerative colitis is usually mucosal, just limited to the colon, and usually continuous. It's a disease of the young. Uh, you are going to have a lot of patients from the age 15 to 40 years, but a lot of studies suggest that there is a biomodal distribution with a second peak of diagnosis at age 55 to 70, which is also seen in clinical practice. Um, because Crohn's is uh, transmutal, it can cause bowel structures and penetrating complications. For example, fistulas, abscesses, perforations, pelvic and fistulas. Um, we all are familiar with uh, Crohn's disease being the disease of the West, uh, highest prevalence being in North America and Europe, uh, and the highest incidence being in Caucasians. But there's where I want to bring this back to you. There is a shifting tide in the prevalence of IUD. Um, with industrialization, the first case of ulcerative colitis was reported in China in 1956, and since then the incidence of inflammatory bowel disease has continued to rise in newly industrialized countries. Um, the incidence of IUD in Asia is estimated to be around 1.4 cases per 100,000 when it's climbing. Um, this second fact is important that I want to bring your attention to. Uh, in the Asia Pacific Crohn's and Colitis Epidemiologic Study, uh, India was uh, at number one, showing a 9.3 per 100,000 person year um, rate. There's no data from Pakistan, so I'm assuming with our cultural similarities, diet similarities, we're somewhere close. Um, in Asia, the, uh, the diagnosis of UC is usually two fold more likely than Crohn's. And as uh, in this ratio is similar to the West, when IBD was beginning to get recognized, and over time the gap between UC and CD closed, so the same thing is happening now. Why is this important? Because IBD is an expensive disease to manage um, for the patient, for the healthcare system, and if this trend continues, it can uh, cause significant health-related socioeconomic burdens for newly, newly industrialized countries. Now, who is at risk? Um, now, IBD does not uh, occur in all genetically predisposed individuals. It's multifactorial. 
you are going to need environmental triggers. Uh, environmental triggers which cause gut microbial dysbiosis. Uh, the Western diet with red meat, processed food, high refined sugars have been um, often blamed, but the one big culprit which everybody believes in is emulsifiers, which is present in a lot of our foods nowadays. If you're a first degree relative of an IBD patient, you're, uh, you carry a higher risk, about 10 to 15 fold higher uh, of having IBD. Now, early exposures to serving infant gut microbiome, including the mode of birth, breastfeeding, exposure to antibiotics, have all been identified as, as risk factors. There is some data out there that babies born by a C-section uh, do not uh, are deprived of the contact with the maternal gut and uh, vaginal microbiome, and hence their gut uh, uh, micro, uh, gut um, bacteria. Did, Sorry about going too fast. I just wanted to finish all of my topics within the time limit because now I don't have enough time. Um, urbanization and air pollution are identified risk factors. NSAID use and hypoxia and high altitude. The reason that they are pointed out is because um, they can cause they're known to cause mucosal infections. Now, like I said, it's not important to know all of the genetic factors just for the regular internet because not all people who are going to be genetically predisposed will have IBD. Um, you, the NOT2 GART15 on chrome 16 is one of the very well known genes. For alien groceries, that's important to know about. The only other two that I wanted to bring your attention to is JAK2 and TIC2 because some of the treatment options that we use nowadays are used, uh, are directed on that pathway. Um, this is an important um, uh, flow to remember. When you have environmental influences in a patient who is genetically susceptible, you are going to have the change in their gut microbiome and mucosal barrier function, as you can see over here. Then uh, antigen presenting cells, which are dendritic cells and macrophages, with active T cells, lead to the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines. And this is then going to lead to um, a, a, a immune tolerance, loss of immune tolerance to commence a bacteria. And uh, this ongoing production of pro-inflammatory cytokines by T cells will lead to a cascade resulting in inflammatory mouth disease. When should you suspect IBD? Um, there can be a multitude of uh, presentations and uh, you start with suspicion and do your work up to confirm it. Patients can have chronic diarrhea in the absence of active infection. Um, now this is more obvious with colonic involvement. Remember patients who are going to have colonic involvement will have diarrhea. A lot of patients who don't have the colon involved and mostly just have small bowel involvement may never have diarrhea. They may just have pain. Uh, patients who have an extended abdominal pain Tenesmus, unexplained anemia, intentional weight loss, malnutrition, failure to thrive or have stunted growth, perianal fistulas, they all merit and um, uh, all merit to work up. The first thing we, uh, we usually advise to check is stool studies for infection, including CF, and also for inflammation. Check lactoferrin and calprotectin, um, and also serum inflammatory markers. If there is no infection and there is inflammation, then you should uh, proceed with workup. The reason we have to do a definitive workup is because the differential is broad. In addition to infectious conditions, there is a multitude of non-infectious conditions which can mimic these symptoms not only just by symptoms but also in endoscopic appearance. And I, uh, the ones that I've listed, I have personally seen all of them, and so I'm sure my seniors have seen. Um, these are more than me. Uh, patients with microscopic colitis, such as collagenous colitis, lymphocytic colitis, SCAD, diversion colitis, ischemic colitis, medication induced colitis, including NSAIDs, radiation enterocolitis. Nowadays, with chemotherapy, checkpoint inhibitor mediated colitis mimics it very well. Appendicitis, diphlitis, solitary rectal ulcers, syndromes, malignancies. They may have similar symptoms. So, we need to do our workup. And how do we start? We start with ileocolonoscopy and imaging. Uh, ileocolonoscopy with biopsies for pathology is our mainstay of diagnosis. We want to get biopsies from the terminal ileum and the colon. Um, and afterwards, if person, uh, we have a high suspicion, and also if it's Crohn's disease, we want to get imaging of the small bowel to evaluate for 
uh, small bowel Crohn's disease. This is the same pathway we also use to follow up for treatment after we start treatment. Uh, follow, following with colonoscopies and MR or CT enterography or capsule endoscopy. Uh, now remember that ma management of IBD is not in a vacuum, it is a team sport and I do mean it. Uh, we are always in contact with our um, GI radiologists, GI pathologists, colorectal surgeons. Once a month we have an interdisciplinary conference where we discuss complicated patients together and get each other's input. So um, the input from pathologists about the disease, the radiologists on how the disease looks on imaging, and the input from surgeons as to how they can intervene is very important. Uh, endoscopically speaking, when we look at inflammation in um, ulcerative colitis, we use the Mayo endoscopic scores. Um, zero is normal, one, and we also don't worry about too much because it's just mild erythema. But um, two and three is what we pay attention to more. Marked uh, erythema with absent vascular pattern, and then if it's just uh, ulceration, spontaneous bleeding, then it's, uh, it's number three. We use the same scores for follow up as well so we can compare how the patient is improving. For uh, Crohn's, we use the simple endoscopic score for Crohn's. Uh, which uses a combined score of five segments, which is the terminal uh, ascending colon, transverse, descending uh, the left colon, and the rectum. And uh, it's the same way we use it for index assessment as well as follow up. Patients who've had an iliocolonic resection, um, they will, uh, we use the Dr. Kirsch score in the uh, Dr. Radhi passed away last year in 2020. Uh, but what we are interested in is looking at in, uh, beyond the anastomosis because patients can have anastomotic ulcers due to surgery but we want to see proximal to the anastomosis how many abscess ulcers are there and what is the degree of involvement and that's how we follow it. Uh, why is pathology important and why do I keep bringing it up? We just, um, I just wanted to again emphasize that there are other, chronic is the important word but there are other conditions that can cause chronic injury with a longer duration of injury such as radiation, ischemia because of prolapse, diverticular disease, autoimmune arthritis, and that's why your input from your pathologist is important. Are there any classic features that are uh, that are important for Crohn's disease? Um, because you can't treat Crohn's until you confirm Crohn's. Um, imaging. This is one of my um, you know special interests within IBD because I published a lot in this. Um, imaging is now an, a very important tool for the gastroenterologist in the management of IBD. Uh, CT enterography has a sensitivity and specific, a specificity of more than 80% for identification of small bowel disease. MR enterography, similarly, we actually prefer MR enterography whenever we have the option. Why? Because our patients are young. They often need multiple imaging studies. We want to prevent exposure to radiation whenever possible. And also, MR enterography is more sensitive for assessment of bowel motility, structures, whether they're inflammatory, fibrotic, and the degree of inflammation. Um, whenever our patients have perianal fistulas or pelvic fistulas, uh, we use MR pelvis with fistula protocol uh, to assess their disease and uh, discuss management. And now, uh, all of these studies are also important for follow up once we've established disease. The, uh, I'm going to quickly go through a few of these images. These are all from my own publications. Um, if you can see that, uh, you can see some bowel thickening over there with luminal narrowing, mucosal enhancement, some uh, luminal narrowing over here, and this hypervascularity that you see over here we call the GOM sign on imaging. This is, we, both of these are CT enterography images. And on, uh, on this side you can see mucosal ulceration, very clearly evident, and small bowel thickening. In uh, Crohn's disease, these are in MR enterography images on the T2 sequence. You can see this area with the luminal narrowing and small bowel edema. And over here, like we have skip lesions and Crohn's, we, have, we see two areas. You can see that. Uh, this is a very good, just, I like this picture just to demonstrate hypervascularity or the cone sign like we just talked about. You can see it very clearly on how the hypervascularity actually looks like a cone. And this is for fistulas, which is another reason why imaging is important for us. Um, you can see an enterocutaneous fistula developing here, very well highlighted by MR enterography. Over here, this picture is for an entero, uh, enteric fistula. So location of the fistula is the amount of gut which is 
healthy, all of these things and help our surgeons to decide surgical approaches. Video capsule endoscopy is a sensitive tool for management of IBD, but it's not that commonly used just because we rely on imaging very well and it's, uh, it's great. It, it can help us to determine the extent of the disease and the, uh, the degree of inflammation. Uh, there are endoscopics, there are scores out there to assess the degree of inflammation. We just don't use them a lot in clinical practice, so I won't go over them. Uh, one important thing to remember, if you think your patient may have a bowel stricture, especially if they have a fibrotic bowel stricture due to bones, or they have, an, um, they have a post-surgical anatomy after surgeries, and a, a video capsule may get stuck. We usually use a patency capsule before we go ahead with the VCE. A patency capsule is just a dry space capsule which is radio opaque. We give it to the patient, take an x-ray afterwards to see if it's fast. Um, and if it does get stuck, it will self-dissolve. It will cause bowel obstruction to the patient. Whereas if this gets stuck, you will take the patient to the OR to get that capsule out. Um, while you've started your workup and you're waiting for uh, your path to come back and to discuss treatment, what should you do? You should we usually get our basic pre-immunosuppression panel. Which, uh, we usually check a quantum group for TB, check for HIV, hepatitis B and C, and we also check thiopurine with hypertransferase activity, and I'll come to that later as to why. Um, and this is also a time to initiate a discussion about the importance of treatment options, uh, complication of untreated disease, and, pre um, and the risks and benefits of the disease. Um, in the past, this step up and step down approach was often used, but it's no longer recommended. Treat to target is the current strategy. Treatment should be tailored according to the severity of the disease and the extent of the disease and patient need, needs. And um, our end goal is to maintain steroid free remission and prevent the complications of untreated IBD. Steroids used to be a mainstay of therapy in the past, but no, no longer. Nowadays, they have a very, very, very limited role, often used just briefly during the induction period to limit symptoms. And sometimes topicals are used um, in such as hydrocortisone enemas and butacinite form for patients who have distal UC. Um, but um, overall, research has shown that they are even less effective than topical ASA agents. Um, there is no data to support that we should use them for maintenance of remission. Five ASA agents also used to be great agents in the past. Um, they are only for UC, remember, not Crohn's. Um, mild to moderate UC, that too. Um, topical formulas we still commonly use, such as animals, suppositories, and foams in patients with mild to moderate UC, which is very distal and is distal to the splenic flexures. Now, this is important, which is that there, be, there are studies that suggest a chemo preventive effect of five ASAs. Um, for cancer, colorectal cancer, but not dysphagia in patients with chronic colitis. So sometimes we use it for that. Um, so immunomodulators. Nowadays, immunomodulators are still commonly used, but in 2021, we hardly ever start patients on monotherapy with immunomodulators. They are great adjunct drugs. To, they are the Robins to your Batman, and your Batman is going to be biologics. Uh, Azathioprine and 6 captiturin they are um, also they're commonly used, um, and uh, azathioprine is actually converted to 6MP non enzymatically after ingestion. Now, we talked about uh, TPMP activity a little while ago about checking it. Why? Because there are patients who are decreased to absent enzyme activity, and hence they have a higher risk of leukopenia when you put them on azathioprine. And I want to show you this pathway over here. For example, if this TPMP activity is absent, you will have a, a higher um, higher um, level of 6TGN, which is our therapeutic metabolite. We follow therape uh, therapeutics with following 6TGN as gastroenterologists, and they will have a high risk of leukopenia. On the other hand, patients who form more 6MMP, which is the uh, metabolite which is more responsible for hepatotoxicity, if the uh, level of 6MMP is about 5700, there is a high risk of hepatotoxicity. We sometimes give allopurinol to shift this um, shift this pathway towards 6 TGM. Now, uh, for uh, regardless of whatever the patient's TPMT activity is, we always follow complete blood counts and liver tests. Uh, in the beginning, every two weeks, and then later on, every three months, for, for the patient, for patients who have normal activity, two to two point five milligrams per kg per day for azathioprine. And then 1 to 1.5, we hardly ever, since we use them as adjuncts, we hardly ever 
get to that maximum dose, we are, we are usually lower than that. Methotrexid is also a great drug. We commonly used 20 to 25 milligrams subcutaneously once weekly. PO doses it has not been shown to be more effective than placebo. So it's quite integral. Some people also give it IM. Patients can have some effects of drug toxicity, such as nausea or diarrhea. Um, but we can reduce that by giving, uh, by giving them one milligram of folic acid per day. Cyclosporin hardly ever. I don't think we hardly ever give cyclosporin for IUD anymore unless you, you are so limited that you can't give any other drug. Now these are your mainstay of therapy or biologics. Um, and amongst anti-DNFs, infliximab, adrenalizumab, and sertolizumab uh, are very commonly used. Um, alpha-4 beta-7 antagonist, uh, which is uh, vedolizumab, and anti-integrin is um, a great drug, which uh, we, uh, we, we now use commonly. Uh, Usticinumab, the uh, IL-1223 inhibitor, also very commonly used, and all of these five drugs, infliximab, adalimumab, sertolizumab, vedo, and usticinumab. Uh, are recommended by the AGA as first-line therapy for uh, for moderate to severe Crohn's, um, also for UC. Now, Janus kinase inhibitors such as tofacitinib, great drug, not first-line. Your patient has to fail the other biologics before you will put them on tofacitinib. We have a lot of patients doing great on them. Um, and then this one, a sphingosine one phosphate modulator, Ozanamod, is the new kid on the block. Just to prove two months ago, we are only beginning, so once daily dose, we are just beginning to put our patients on it. Again, not first line, but for patients who fail by the biologics. Um, the other um, alpha 4 antagonist, natalizumab, was also commonly used in the past. It's an anti integrin as well. The reason it's it's not no longer first line and its use is limited is because there is a PML risk with a JC virus. So we do recommend screening for JC virus if you want to start it. But again, uh, if you have other options, we avoid it. I'm going to skip this slide in the interest of time and um, uh, come to the ass uh, assessment of response to therapy. Once you start them on therapy, you need to follow up in at least six months with a colonoscopy or imaging if the disease is isolated to the small bowel because you need to assess response to therapy. Um, if they have if they haven't completely reached remission, you may need to adjust the dose or frequency of treatment. If there is complete primary failure, like they haven't even responded to treatment at all that you started them on, then you may need to have an out of class switch. For example, if you are you have them on an anti DNF like infliximab and they have not responded, you may need to put them on an anti integrant like vedolizumab. Um, and some other important points to remember: patients who have fistulizing Crohn's should be on dual therapy, preferably the biologic and an immunomodulator. Remember I told you your immunomodulators are the uh, Robins to your Batman. Um, they prevent formation of antibodies and they also improve the performance of the biologic. Um, preferably you prefer to use anti-DNFs in fistulizing disease also. Now patients who have severe internal fistulization Fistulas may need bowel rest and TPN also remember, in addition to therapy before they are ready for surgery. You do not need to stop biologics or immunosuppressions on your patients who need surgery for bowel surgery for management of IBD. In fact, our surgeons prefer it. They want all of our patients on biologics and off steroids for uh, at least uh, four to six weeks before they take them to the OR because they have better surgical outcomes. Um, and since 2020, there is a push to not use infliximab as monotherapy. Um, we prefer to use it with an immunomodulator over monotherapy because it is one of our favorite drugs for treating IBD, but it also has the highest potential of making antibodies to the neuron protein that it has. So we want to save it as much as possible and prevent the prevention of antibody formation. Um, and then we want, uh, remember we also have to monitor them for major risks of immunosuppression, such as infection, lymphoma, and non-melanoma skin cancer. Um, I'm just going to briefly mention these and not go into detail. Some of the common surgical options that are um, that we use for IBD is senior placement and fistulotomies for patients with perianal fistulas. Then our patients may need bowel sparing stricture plasty, um, may need bowel resection with either a primary anastomosis or an ostomy formation, uh, and they also may need total colectomy with sphincter preservation. Um, and you may have heard of the J pouch, ideal pouch, ideal anastomosis, very common. J pouch is the more common one. There are other pouches that we use. 
Um, but if they have, um, based on cancer or fish, their level of fistulization, they may also need over proper colectomy. Um, a few quick words about IVD health maintenance. Um, immunizations. Avoid live vaccines. No live vaccines while they're on renal depression. On, our, on all, of, all our visits, we make sure they're up to date on their vaccinations. The ones we check for, flu, shingles, remember the inactive shingles vaccine, and the pneumonia vaccines, and now the COVID-19 vaccine. We monitor uh, our patients every three months with uh, lab work. Why? One, uh, for changes in inflammation, uh, so we can uh, we suspect that, but also for uh, signs of drug toxicity. For example, leukopenia, if elevated inflammatory markers, suspecting infection, any renal failure, for example, if there are five ASAs, hepatotoxicity, and then anything that reflects uh, poor nutritional status, such as the basic ones we always check for, vitamin B, iron panel, and uh, pre albumin And if any of them um, are deficient, we go ahead and make sure that uh, we follow them up and after replacement. They are going to need regular colonoscopies, not only for disease follow-up, but later on for colo and colorectal cancer studies. I'll come to that in a second. And MR enterography and CT enterography when they have small bowel disease for follow-up. Um, because of chronic inflammation, they have higher osteoclastic activity and they are at higher risk of bone loss due to chronic inflammation. If they have been on long-term steroid use in the past, they are at a higher risk. So we always get a baseline DEXA scan. Um, after we have them in remission, and then based on the results of that, if there's just osteopenia versus osteoporosis, we follow up subsequently. They are going to need regular derm exams, not just for the skin manifestations of IVD that can happen, but remember also because of the risk of non melanoma skin cancer. <laughs> the American College of OBGYN and American College of Gastroenterology they recommend that IVD patients taking long term immunosuppressive medications should have annual PAPs. Why? Because they are at a higher risk for cervical dysplasia. They are also going to need regular eye exams because of uh, ocular manifestations of IVD that can happen. Um, for surveillance, if patients have had symptoms of colitis for over eight years, um, we want to start them on colorectal cancer um, screening with colonoscopies um, and with random biopsies. And based on the, those, those results, we may need to repeat uh, annually or every two years. If the uh, inflammation is limited to just the sigmoid colon in the rectum, they are not at high risk. Just um, propto sigmoiditis, then they are not at, at a high risk. If your patient has PSC with IVD, their risk for colorectal cancer increases exponentially and then you need to scope them once right away and then every year for um, colorectal cancer screening. If you find dysplasia, that does not always mean that your patient needs their colon out. Very often we can identify, we can localize these sites and re remove it endoscopically. Sometimes they're just in polyps and we can remove that polyp. If they don't show up in random biopsies, we can just remove the, that area and just follow on subsequent colonoscopies. But if that area is invisible, like it showed up in a random um, biopsy and you couldn't really identify it endoscopically as to which area was this plastic, then you need to refer to um, a surgeon. Um, in summary, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, the, the few important points I want to emphasize, it's a chronic inflammatory autoimmune disease. It's going to happen in genetically predisposed individuals uh, caused by bacterial dysbiosis and it comprises ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. Um, the incidence and prevalence is now rising in newly industrialized countries such as I showed you, including India and South Asia. So we should uh, be familiar with its, uh, with its presentation. Uh, very important to always check stool studies to rule out inflammation versus infection. And this is not just for initial diagnosis. If a patient with known IVD comes up with new symptoms with a quote unquote flare, the, uh, sometimes it's not worsening inflammation, it's just an infection that you need to treat. So you should always check in, uh, stool studies. If your colonoscopy with biopsies for PATH and CT MRE are very sensitive diagnostic tools for us, for us gastroenterologists for diagnosis and follow-up of IVD. Um, five ASA agents, they are not recommended for Crohn's. You, you can still use them for mild to moderate UC and for chemo preventative effect. 
um, are the FDA recommends treating adult outpatients with moderate to severe luminal CD, and also uh, you see with infliximab, adalimumab, sotilizumab, vedo, or estricanumab over no treatment. And steroids have a limited use in induction, no role in maintenance. Patients are going to require surveillance for colorectal cancer, and they are going to require regular follow-up for their health maintenance needs. Um, I would like to thank our UF IVD team who are all my teachers. I would like to thank some of the teachers in this room who taught me while I was in med school. Um, I would like to thank, thank the panel and the audience and Rose, I would like to welcome your questions. And again, I apologize for speaking a bit too fast. I didn't want, uh, I wanted to finish my talk at the time. Thank you.